The title of the message is A True Friend Builds You Up. Now each week between now and when we kick off for Christmas, we're going to talk about relationships and from different angles. We're going to talk about how to talk to people. We're going to talk about how to start a conversation. Today I just want to go over some basics. Some, a basic understanding of real friendships. Now, I have lived most of my life in Delaware County. And all of us seem to take for granted relationships. Many of us never give any thought whatsoever to the environment that we were raised, or the culture that we were birthed into, and how those things shaped who we are and how we have friends. Recently, I was introduced to a comedy show on the Comedy Network called Delco Proper. The, exp the uh, exploits of Izzy, Tom, and John. There's nothing proper about Delco Proper. It's vile. It's a bit overwhelming. And I know three guys named Izzy, a couple guys named Tom, excuse me, a couple guys, yeah, a couple guys named Tom, and the guy John. Let's just say that the character in the movie, I actually knew four different guys that resembled him. And I went to school with two or three guys that resembled Izzy, who was always looking for a fight. But the gist of the thing is that they're going to a funeral. And they're complaining about going to the funeral in the midst of complaining about their inability to pick up chicks. Now, <clears throat> As my daughter, where's my daughter? She's in the nursery. As my daughter said, dear Lord, Dad, this, this, they nailed it. This is the average Delaware Countyan. I went to school with these guys. I was once one of them. You know, Izzy all the way there is talking about how he's hoping so-and-so will show up to the, the funeral so he can beat him up. Did you have guys like that in high school that they just want to come along because if so-and-so came, they would have a fight? Tom, no, excuse me, John. John is at the funeral. And he texts this chick in the front row about going out with him. The very girl who is the girlfriend of the dead guy. Hey, at least you know she's single. Yes. <laughs> And then she stands up and goes, you texted me? Do you know I, went out, I was going out with And he stands up and professes his true love. Now, it was so hilarious, other than the vile language, for the simple fact that I went to a funeral in high school and I had a friend who actually did this. <laughs> and I'm sitting back saying, wow, we have no clue because of our heritage, our culture, and the environment that we were raised in to have real relationships. This series, we're really going to get into relationships. and How does God view relationships? How did God make us to treat each other? And again, the premise that I, I, I gave you just shortly ago, <clears throat> the Bible says that the lost world will know that you're his disciples by how you treat each other. By how you treat each other, they're going to say, I want your Christianity. Which means, if we live like Delco proper, <clears throat> little wonder no one's getting saved. So, let's talk about relationships. Now, here's the first one. Turn with me to Proverbs 27:17. <clears throat> Cannot believe my voice I lost it. 27. 17. It says this, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. And the first point is this, a true friend encourages you. Now, I have a whole message that I can preach on sarcasm. Not really? Yes. By the way, Jen, welcome back. <laughs> Missed you. Sarcasm is not a gift to encourage people. As my buddy Brian Musser says, he had he realized early on that he had the gift of discouragement. <clears throat> uh, 
Each of us has times in our life where things have come upon us that we wouldn't choose to go through. But we find ourselves going through. It's times like this that we need true friends. A true friend will encourage you, help you, build you up, and support you with what you're going through. Oftentimes, this doesn't require us to say anything. It's simply enough that we're there. Young boy was sent to the corner store by his mom to get a loaf of bread. He was gone an extraordinary amount of time. And when, she came, when he came back, his mom said, where have you been? I've been worried sick about you. He said, well, there was this little boy sitting on the side of the road with a broken bicycle. He was crying, so I stopped to help him. His mom goes, I didn't know you know how to fix bicycles. He goes, I didn't. I just sat there and cried with him. <laughs> now listen, a true friend encourages you. I'm going to talk, to, talk about my buddy Kenny for a second. Uh, Kenny and I go back to high school. I remember when he moved from Cleveland to, to Booth when We became best of friends. We were both in theater. We were both band geeks. Forty years later, we're still friends. When my dad passed away three years ago, you know, it had been a while. I had reconnected with Ken on Facebook, but we hadn't physically seen each other. Ken showed up to the funeral. I, did, I failed to mention that Ken lived two hours away. Ken showed up at my dad's funeral. And he hugged me and held on to me. We hadn't physically hung out in almost 20 years. You see, a friend, a true friend, encourages you with what you're going through. And again, this is a hallmark of what you look, I, I, you, know, may, you know, listen, we all have things about us where we're deficient. We're not perfect in these areas. We all have areas we have room for growth. But the fact is you gotta know what the standard is. What should I be looking for in a friend? And you need a friend who's gonna be there for you. You need a friend who's gonna encourage you. You need a friend who's gonna build you up. Too many of you folks go through life alone. Or, if you're under 35, and you live, you, you're in a generation where you've lost the art of conversation, you don't know how to talk to people to build relationships to get to the place where you have a true friend. Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, that iron sharpens iron. It's like that, that stone that you sharpen a knife on. You can't have one without the other. And you need relationships that are going to support you and encourage you. This is the second thing. A true friend's going to exhort you. Stay in Proverbs 27 and look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. A true friend will help you do what you ought to do. You need to get to this place where you have a friend who's going to stoke your flames. The story of um, Ulysses S. Grant. Now, everybody knows that he, was, he struggled with alcoholism. Well, what most people do not know is that Grant had a friend, his chief of staff, John Rawlings. And they made this pact at the beginning of his uh, leadership. And Grant confessed to Rawlings that I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> if you see me start drinking, I need you to confront me. And Rawlings did. Every time Grant fell off the wagon and went on the binge, it was his chief of staff that hunted him down, chided him, got in his face, encouraged him to get off the bottle and get back focused. Now, we know that Grant went on and became one of the most dynamic generals in the Civil War. We know that he ended up becoming president of the United States. And if you look at our, the Capitol Mall, Outside the Capitol on the South Lawn is a statue to General Grant. Really cool one on his horse. But what you don't know, at the very opposite end of the mall, there's Rawlings Park with a very subdued statue of John Rawlings. 
that when they built the one statue, Grant said, I didn't get here alone. You need somebody to extol you, to get in your face, to build you up. I had a, I've had several people in the, over my years who I was working in Washington, D.C. I was out on a sales call. I was new in the field. And I lied to a customer. And I got caught in my lie. 24 years old. I got back to my office and my sales manager took me for a walk. He goes, I want you to know that I'm going, I'm right, as of right now, I'm going to fire you. And I said nothing. He kept talking. He goes, but you know, I think you have incredible potential. And I want you to know this is a learning moment in your life. He goes, I want you to get in your car, and I want you to go back to this person's house. It was an hour away. He goes, I want you to apologize to them. And I want you to make it right. And then I want you to come back and see me. Drove out to Deal, Maryland, on the, on the Chesapeake. Retired guy from NASA. I stood in his front yard and I said, listen up. I explained what I did wrong and I asked for forgiveness. They gave it to me. They called my boss and went back to the office. He hugged me. He said, I'm putting you into a training program because you proved to me you're teachable. Three months later, I got promoted to his job and he was bumped upstairs. You need friends in your life who are going to get in your face and tell you the truth and encourage you to do the right thing. It's the third thing. A true friend empowers you. <coughs> Turn with me to John 15. Keep your finger there as we talk. We have things in our life that are going to need to be addressed in order that we might successful, be successful at what God has called us to be. Oftentimes it's going to involve a change in character or a life change, our development. Back in the 15th century in Nuremberg, there was a family with 18 children. The dad, who was a goldsmith, worked 18 hours a day with odd jobs in his, his craft just to keep food on the table. Yet two of his sons had a dream of becoming great artists. Both of them wanted to pursue it, but they knew that their father would never be able to support them. So they made a pact. One would go on to the Academy of Art and study art, and the other would go and work in the mines to support his brother. And when the first one graduated, he would take care of the other one. Well, Albrecht, who was the one who went to the art school, within four years, was on his way to being not only a great artist, but a well-paid, commissioned artist. When he graduated, his family he came home and his family threw a party. And they were celebrating. And here he is, he's a working artist, he's making a, making a great living. And he toasted his brother saying, thank you, Albert, for what you did for me. It's now my turn to help you. And Albert said, no, it's too late. Look at my hands. I've busted every finger I've had in the last four years. I have arthritis so bad, I can bear, barely hold a hammer, let alone a paintbrush. My dream of being an artist is over. Well, Albrecht Dulcer is the, is the artist. He, he has over 450 paintings in museums all over the world. But the one he's most famous for is called The Praying Hands. You, you probably have a picture of it somewhere, where the hands are together. And there's these broken hands that are praying. What you might not know is the subject for those hands was his brother. 
And it was his favorite painting because it was a testament to what his brother was willing to sacrifice to help him become great. In John 15, 13, it says, this is the very best way to love, to put your life on the line for your friends. My challenge to you this morning is, who are you sacrificing for? Who are you willing? Do you have a friend willing to do what it takes to help you? Are you that kind of friend to somebody else? I have a pastor friend who is ministering in Pittsburgh. He's in really a rough area. Um, he got a call from a friend one day and said, listen, I know you're struggling, and I know you're raising your own support. I know that your health is such that you're not able to work. I want you to know I'm sending you $700 a month until, until, you, until such time where you're able to, to have a job and support yourself. In order for us to have the strength to succeed, we need friends who are willing to sacrifice for us, to build us up. It might be just a bag of groceries. You know, I have a friend, Jim, who I haven't seen for a while. He's, he's very retired now. Sort of, our distance has grown. Jim wasn't the most wealthy man in the world, but he had six kids. And he was like a, a second dad to me. And somehow God knew when for him to prompt to call me. And every it was like counting on the fact that I was having a difficult day. Jim would call me and say, you're 15 minutes from me, let's go to lunch. And he would take me, treat me to lunch, and talk to me like a father talks to a son. <laughs> Be the friend that you want a friend to be. The uh, Charlie Brown movie is coming out. I can't wait to see it. I mean, I am a football head. I have, I remember Locust Hill Elementary School playing kickball. This girl who I won't name her name, because she follows my blog. But I remember the first time that I went to kick the ball, and she was holding the ball, and she pulled it away when I went to kick the ball. And I fell flat on my back, and she starts laughing. She goes, I watched Charlie Brown last night. <laughs> so that's my memory of Charlie Brown. And <clears throat> anyway. One day, Charlie Brown was talking to Linus. They were leaning on the wall like they normally do. <clears throat> and Charlie Brown asked Linus, <clears throat> what would you do if you felt that nobody liked you? Linus responded, well, Charlie Brown, I guess I would take a real hard look at myself. Ask if I am doing anything that turns people off. How can I prove myself? Do I need to change in some way? Yep, that's my answer, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown says, I hate that answer. <laughs> we all do. You see, for you and I to become what God has called us to be, if we're truly to be a place that is welcoming, a place that is affirming, a place that when someone comes in the back door, they say, wow, I want to I want to be I want to be one of these guys, gals. It's going to take us being willing to look at God's standard of friendship and saying, I want to be that way, you know? Maybe I don't have the courage to speak truth to my friends. i got to work on that, you know? Maybe I'm not encouraging enough to my friends. You just show yourself friendly to be friends. So this morning, um, because of my voice, we're not going to sing anymore, but we're going to pray, and we're going to take an offering, and 
afterwards, just talk to each other. Talk to each other about what you've, what struck you in the message this morning. You know, let's start with the iron sharpening thing, the iron. You know, let's find out how we can encourage each other this morning and build each other up as a church. Father, we come and we thank you for your word, for the simple truths that are there that echo in our hearts. Cause us, Father, to walk in your ways this day and change us. Help us to become great friends. Help us to be there for each other, to have the courage to talk to each other. Draw, drag us out of ourselves, Father, that you would stretch us to become the people that you designed us to be, that what others need. Change us today, Father. We ask this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.